For those who don't know me, I'm John. I'm going to talk about chapters 23 and 24, which are the performance chapters. Uh, as you can see, it is the 2nd of September where I am, and first for you, so I hope that's not a problem for the, <laughs> um, for the repo, keeping track of the dates. Let's see, where are we? Sorry, bear with me for just a second. Let me open my chat window. Here for me is London, UK. That's where I am. So I made changes half an hour ago just after midnight here. Right, so, so it's all about how to go fast, how to keep your code running smoothly, how to find out what's slowing it down, and then how to give some, some ideas for what you can do to experiment to make it go faster. Um, so we'll go through it in order, uh, starting with, with going slow. And, and he really sort of, in my, in my mind, he, he looks at it as an experiment. Like, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna see what's happening. Let's try to pick it apart and, and see uh, where the problems are. And then to make it fast, let's go and change something and see if it makes it better and then take good notes and, and go from there. So as a scientist, that really, it's close to home with me. Um, for for diag diagnosing uh, the speed, he talks about two main things. One is is profiling, which is sort of a very zoomed out view of the code as a whole. And then he talks, the next section will be about micro profiling, where we look at, at small little code chunks and we look at it in detail. Um, for profiling, it's all, everything he talks about is in this package called prof. Viz. I'm not sure if that's the right way to say it. That's what I say. Um, and and he says that it's that there are, there are several different types of profilers, but this is an example of a of a sampling profiler. And what that means is that it will take a snapshot of the call stack every I don't know ten milliseconds, and then doing that throughout the run of the of the code, build up a picture of where the code is spending its time. Um, I'm looking at at comments here. Just write and see. Okay. Um, does what is meant when he says the sampling profiler is fundamentally stochastic? Uh, what he means by that is that you don't actually know everything that's happening. And so if you run it the same exact thing through the profiler a couple times, you might see slightly different outcomes because it's only sampling. It's not telling you an exact picture of everything that's there. Um, right. So this is an example I lifted from the book. Uh, here's the first figure, and he, he has this, this this call stack here. So function f is going to have a pause. This pause functionality is part of the profviz package. Um, if you pause other ways, then it doesn't see it. So use that one if you want to try to introduce pauses to your to your to your um, flame graph. That's what, what this is called over here. Uh, this calls G, which in turn has a pause and calls H, and then this one calls H again, and H has its own pause. And so this is what you should see. Uh, at the bottom, function F is first pausing, then calling G. G is pausing and calling H. H is pausing and then goes back to F, which calls, calls, calls H and then pauses again. And you get this nice um, plot here of where the code is spending its time as it goes through there, and, and that's... You know, Pretty straightforward, it's easy to see. The problem is, I don't know about you guys, but when I was starting to do this and when I go through these chapters, I, I read it sort of as quickly and then I go and type in the code and try to reproduce what he's done and I always get the same results even if I don't understand it. But this was the first time I typed what he typed and I didn't get the same results. Uh, and it took quite a bit of messing around and help from other people on, on on our website, on our on our Slack channel, to figure out that this doesn't actually work quite as advertised for our greater than 4.0. Um, Profviz hasn't been updated for our 4.0, so I'll show you what it looked like for me. Um, can you guys see this flame chart? Okay, here. So here's the same function call, and you can see the pauses don't show up as spending any time, uh, and all that time is just put into the next step. Uh, you can see the same thing down here, pauses disappear. If you were to do the same thing called profviz with just the pause function, you'd actually get an error. It, it stops execution and it says something about it can't coerce a data frame or, or something like that. I don't remember exactly what the error code was. 
Uh, so this doesn't actually work as prettily in R 4.0. Uh, I did try going back to an older version of R, so I tried R 3.6 and it worked just fine, like it's supposed to. So if it really upsets you and you wanna to try to recreate this, just as shown in the book, you can do that. Here are some tips for how you might do that. You can just install an older version of R from CRAN, or there's this R switch utility. Here, I tried to use that and I couldn't get it to work. Bob Rudis also has a wrapper around that, that's sort of a desktop app that you can use to switch R versions. And uh, again, I couldn't get that to work. It, it, I downloaded it, I could, I could open it, but when I fired it up, it just stopped everything, nothing happened. <laughs> so there is, if you're comfortable with the command line, you can go into your, you're on the Mac or Unix machine, you can go here and you can just change the alias for the current R directory and put it back to uh, older versions if you're so inclined. Um, I don't know about you, that that's always gets, makes me a little bit nervous doing, uh, playing around with system files and things like that. But um, it's actually, it, it worked fine for me. So if you care to recreate this, those are some options. The next thing he talks about is memory profiling. So this is when you're looking at events that are using up a lot of memory and then in turn have to call the garbage collector. And that's what we can, can see here. So, so in this function, we've got, I guess, 10,000 iterations of adding one onto this vector X. And, and as you can imagine, that's gonna be slow and it's gonna take a lot of memory. And so now you see that there's a, a, a bar for memory being allocated and then memory being freed up on this side here. That's how you read that. Again, if you're using this in R 4.0 or higher, 4.0, uh, you won't, the C, the, the C concatenate, I suppose, or combine, I'm not sure what it really stands for. Uh, it doesn't show up. All you see is the garbage collector and this line of code disappears. So that's not especially useful. Um, but again, if you want to go back to R3.6 or, or lower, it would probably work fine. He does mention that there are some limitations to the profiling. Um, for example, it doesn't go down to C code. Uh, and as just a tip, if you're using a lot of anonymous functions, you're not going to be able to make sense of what gets what comes out of it. So just give those functions names if you really want to try to make sense of it. He also mentions about lazy evaluation and that it can sometimes give misleading outputs. Uh, and here's an, the example from the book. So function i, which is returning just the number 10, and function j, which adds 10 onto its argument. So if you, if, you, if you execute this, it will appear as if j is actually calling i from within the function, but it's not. It's, it's calling... Um, it's evaluating, I, I guess is the right way to say it, rather than calling it. Uh, so that's a bit misleading. Uh, it didn't really upset me until I read about it and, and then saw why, why Hadley thinks it's worth, it's noteworthy. Uh, question about why 4.0 borked it, I don't know. Um, I guess it'd be a great idea if you wanted to contribute to the package. Um, there is a, a, a issue raised for it at the moment. Um, but that's well beyond my expertise and how I'd go about fixing it. If you go to the ProfViz website, they also talk about um, sort of other extensions of the functionality, and one is to profile Shiny apps. Uh, this example from the website wasn't especially useful, at least in my mind. Uh, you get kind of this, this mess of, of, of blank bars and I'll, I'll show you what that looks like on the real thing here. Um, you know, most of these aren't really very helpful to try to make sense of, of, of what's going on in your code. Um, however, I will say that I've used this before to debug shiny, shiny code when I had some things that were taking up a lot of memory and um, down here at the lower levels, it was sort of clear where I was, I was bogging things down. So I think it can be useful, um, but it's perhaps limited. You can use it on small pieces of, of, of code within Shiny as well if you want to, and there's some guidance on the website about how you would do that. So that's the, the zoomed out version, the, the profiling. Um, he then talks about micro benchmarking, where you take a tiny bit of code and you 
get really precise estimates of how long it takes to run. Uh, and this is most of what we'll spend the time with for the rest of, of this chapter and next chapter. But he does have a few warnings, for example, a lot of times what you see gets masked by the more generalized code that lies above it. And he has this nice quote that a deep understanding of subatomic physics is not very helpful when you're baking. Um, which I guess we can all test it. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's, it can be useful, but sometimes you have to take it with a pinch of salt as well. To do this, we're going to use the bench package. Uh, the bench package has a very precise timer on it, so you can get down to nanosecond time resolution. And the way you use it is you give it several different functions that you want to test, just separated by commas, and it will give you this output that shows you how it's done um, for each of the, how each one is done. So, for example, here he's taking x and he's looking for the square root of it using the square root function or the square root raising it to the half x and then, uh, exponent. And as you can see here, the latter form is quite a bit slower by, I guess, about sevenfold or so. Um, there's an exercise in the book where he extends this and asks you to look at a couple of other versions of generating the square root. Uh, and of all of those, the square root function is the fastest. I have to say, maybe somebody else can can illuminate me. It's not really clear to me why this version should be so much slower than that. Um, I realize there's sort of maybe two operations going here and there's a floating point number, but otherwise I don't really know. It, it, it's not clear to me why that should be so much slower. Does anybody have any any ideas? Uh, just custom from like other things you talked about in the chapter, it could be like it's doing more checks, you know, under the hood. Mm -hmm. right. And then obviously just the implementation difference with how it's implemented. I haven't looked, but it could just be whatever uh, C code, I assume this is internal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that too. You're talking about the exponential versus the square root? Yes. Oh. Um. Well, I'm guessing that square root is optimized for that particular power. I mean, that, that's not much of an answer, but, <laughs> um, you know, because, well, I mean, square root by definition is to the power two, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, to the power one half, actually. Yeah, sorry. Right? So, um, I don't know. Wait, I, it's, saying that the, it's saying that the square, like, to the power of 0.5 is faster and if I'm interpreting that wrong I don't know my Greek uh, yeah so 2.1 is actually 2100 compared to the it, it, it's, it's microseconds versus yeah, nanoseconds. one is micro one is nano right yes yeah, okay so so is faster. okay because I'm looking at the iterations per second and I was like wait I thought the I thought the bottom one was faster but I don't know my Greek at all so sure. <laughs> Yeah, no, the top one's about sevenfold faster. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, That's I know that there are a lot of algorithms specifically for calculating the square root, right? Um, but I don't know that any of the, you know, but I do, do, do the one I can think of, I, I don't know that it's particularly fast. It's, not, it's just used for teaching. But, yeah. Yeah. And so it, if it's, why are the iterations per second faster on the second? Or not faster, more. Yeah. Well, they're not doing the same thing. So oh, oh, it's I because the, you're looking at the, the difference is, well, the median versus, He, recommend, he recommends using the median as sort of your, your metric out of all this. The minimum is kind of dubious. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I just interpret this as being that, that there are sometimes where a square root of x, the first one has very long run times and the x to the 0.5 is fairly 
constant. Otherwise, I, I don't see how you end up getting more iterations per second with the second versus the first. Hmm. Well, like, I don't think it's the same algorithm necessarily. Well, I don't think it's the same algorithm, but I just don't know how to square the, you know, going by median, you you choose the first one. Going by iterations per second, you choose the second one. Uh, wait, wait, the median is, is in terms of time, right? But the iterations per second is like a, that's like a computational complexity measure of, what I'm saying is like, I, I, I don't think the iterations are, 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 are comparable. Well, but the, each iteration is, is an iteration that returns the same result. Yeah, those numbers don't really lie. I mean, I can I get the min and median, but I mean, Tyler is right. If you looked at just iterations per second, in my interpretation, it would seem to indicate, you know, the second's better, but if you look at min and median, it's the first one back now. Well, so I read Randy's example, and my iterations per second matches up with the median being faster. Um, so it, I have like 484, I'll stick it. But like the top one is faster in both for, my, for me. So I don't know if that's just a weird iteration for John, but mine is faster in both median and iterations per second. And I'm curious as to how it happened that <laughs> John's wasn't. That makes sense. Yeah, but what I'm saying is like, I don't think iterations per second each, I don't think in each context that an iteration gets you equivalently close to your answer. Right? Um, I don't know, maybe that didn't make sense. Well, I think it's just math on the same thing. number. Could it like, be that it, it does a certain number of iterations just to get a large enough sample that you know, iterations is sort of held constant? We're going to do it half quarter of a million times and then base our calculation off that. No, I guess that wouldn't that wouldn't help though, would it? No, like I think the iterations is a is is a property of whatever numeric scheme you're using to get the answer. Right, so all these algorithms, they, they would have some termination criteria. And you're iterating until you meet, right, so. Yeah, so my function ran it 10,000 times. So I'm assuming it, it's multiplying your, either your total time or your median time up to a full second, just to have like a human, readable thing for longer functions is what my guess would be. I'm just curious as to how it happened that it's so different. That's, that's my question. Mm -hmm. But uh, in any case, right. my computer must also just be slow because mine are both in microseconds and not nanoseconds. <laughs> anyway, right, well. not something to just get stuck on. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> talk about like tiny iterations here. Uh, if you plot that, so so this function here, LB. If you plot that, you get this uh, B swarm plot uh, that just sort of shows you the distribution of all these attempts, um, which is. Yeah. Nice, I think the median is probably just as useful or more so. So that's it for, for looking at, at profiling and, and measuring speed. Yeah, could you go back to the previous slide if you don't mind? Sure. sure. Just, just one second. From this, it's really obvious where the difference lies. I mean, even the, the median, I don't know how to interpret this. Like, I don't know where the median is. Is it that weird 
blurb that's in the middle because that's or is it like how like i can three uh 700 nanoseconds let's say for the bottom one so this is log scale um so like right about there around there i guess yeah wow That's interesting because it has a really long tail. The mm. the square root of it. Yeah, and Maya has a question. He talks about modal multimodality here. Um, using computer version for a few random iterations. Yeah. Mm. Shall we move on? Yeah, sorry about that. I had, it was an amber alert, so I got disconnected. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the next chapter, 24, is all about you know things you can do to make your code go faster, which which I found really useful and really interesting. I think it's a bit. It, both of these are different than the chapters we read recently, in that we're not really diving into a concept in detail and really picking it apart and understanding the nuts and bolts of the language. It's more here are a bunch of tips. Here are some ways to approach the problem, and you know, go away and 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 practice and get better at it. Um, so, I found it really useful. It's not a an in depth study, let's say. Um, and he mentions that there's four techniques. I counted five. I'm not sure where the the discrepancy is there, but here are the five that I got: uh, organizing your code, looking for existing solutions, being lazy, vectorizing, and then avoiding copying your data. Um, this part is pretty straightforward, organizing your code. I think really what he means is just make it so that it's, it's something you can quickly test with the representative examples, have it wrapped up in functions so that you can put it right into the bench, up right into the benchmark um, function and get a nice clean output. And if you're a scientist, that probably is satisfying to you because it's a nice, clean, interpretable result. Um, here's this example with two different ways of calculating mean and you can see uh, sort of to me counterintuitively the second version that has I guess three calculations is faster um, and again I'm not really sure why that would be I think he, he mentioned something about it in the chapter um, so you know you, you get at least to me unexpected results sometimes out of these. Uh, this section here, checking for existing solutions, I found really useful because a lot of these resources I didn't know existed. It's not much to, to study and learn except just to know that they're here. Uh, I put them all into the slides. So, you know, people looking at this in the future might have a place to go and clip quickly. Uh, this top one, task views, uh, this is a resource of, of sort of high performance alternatives to common packages, which uh, the, the exercises mention quite a bit. And, and uh, it's probably really useful. I didn't know it was there. I think I'd seen it once years ago and forgotten about it. Um, but it's good to know. Uh, I don't know much about uh, C++ and RCC, RCPP. So I think that's the topic of next week. So perhaps we'll get into that more. Uh, and then going out there and talking to people and reading code. And he, he, he emphasizes that a lot, that, you know, it's good practice just to look at code and look at people's solutions for, you know, basically for fun. And, and the more you do it, the more you'll understand how fast code goes fast and how people solve these problems that you might be facing with your code. RSeq is really useful. Um, I didn't know it existed either until I read this chapter, so I found that nice and I bookmarked it. Uh, the R tag on Stack Overflow, of course. And I, I myself use the community portal at rstudio.com. Uh, he didn't mention that, um, um, but I found it to be a really good resource as well as all of us. Uh, so there are some, some resources for everyone down the road. The third tip is to do as little as possible. And, and and there's a case study at the end where he goes into a bit more detail about this. And this is really useful. It can mean, mean a couple of things. One is it can mean use functions that do the bare minimum of what you need, but it can also mean 
trim away functions that do extra stuff that you don't need. So for example, you, the case study at the back of the chapter is about t-tests that not only give you a t-statistic, but give you a bunch of other stuff that you don't need. And if you can get rid of the other stuff, then you can do it a lot faster. Um, I'll go through the case study at, at the end. Um, Again, this is sort of like the previous section where it's just a lot of tips that are useful and many of these things I didn't know about. I'm not the, the world's best R programmer, but it was really useful to, to see these things. Um, for example, this one here, any, rather than looking for, um, for inclusion uh, is a nice, nice thing to bear in mind. Uh, and then also just sort of other tips you know, read CSV. I think uh, I'd heard that you know this was the better version over here with the underscore. Didn't really know why, um, but uh, there you go. So yeah, just a bunch of tips. I'm not going to go through them in, in detail. And then it goes into a, an example of uh, trying to avoid method dispatch. And I guess the idea is that if you can do the dispatch. If you can be explicit about the dispatch, then, the, then it doesn't have to do it on its own and you can save time. And so he has this example where he calls the mean for, for this, this vector or he calls the method itself directly, the default method. And he shows that there's about a twofold increase in, in speed. Um, but he also says that if you, if you do it more often, that difference disappears. So this was 100 uh, calculations. Here is uh, 10,000, and the difference is almost negligible. Um, so this sort of echoes what he said at the very beginning, that, that sometimes the higher level stuff in your code is going to just mask whatever effects you're seeing. He also talks about using the eternal methods. And I went to type this into my my R session and I got this pop-up where it warns you that only true wizards should consider using this function or even consider using this function. Um, so I guess if you're going to do that, you should be competent in your wizarding powers and know what you're doing. Um, so yeah, I think there are places where you can definitely gain speed, but you've got to use caution and make sure you're, you're doing what you know what you're doing. You're really doing what you, what you think you're doing, and you're also not opening yourself up to unexpected results if you don't have the right input, for example. And he mentioned that that can be a problem. Um, to me, it seems like it's probably not worth messing with it unless you're really confident about what your functions are doing. Uh, he gives another example about avoiding input coercion. So. Um, it talks about this function as data frame. And I guess what it does is it takes each element, puts it in a data frame, and then goes down and grabs the next element, makes the data frame, and does a, an R bind to the first one, and then does the third one, and does an R bind to the first two. And you do that over and over again. And so he, he tests that with this example. Um, so here he's made this list. So it's uh, 26 elements. Each one's 1,000 units long and it's given it names. Uh, and what you can do is rather than coerce that into a data frame using the as data frame function, you can just call it a data frame with the class attribute and give it the row names. Uh, here's just the, the head of the top of that list so you get an idea of what it looks like. And here's the output from the benchmarking. And you know, in this example, it's you know, probably close to 500 fold faster doing it, doing it the way he described. So there can be sizable improvements uh, if you're clever about it. However, he also, after he goes through this example, he says that, that for him to figure out how to do this thing that he just described, he had to spend hours going through the source code for, for these functions and really digging into the details. So I think, you know, this, probably a lot of potential there to save some speed, but you've got to really want it if you're going to, if you're going to try to do this kind of thing that he's doing here. Um, I think it's a good idea to go through source code, but I'm usually I'm pretty lazy about trying to, to dig into it and, and, and really understand what's going on largely because I'm usually trying to get something quick and not trying to optimize. 
I think if I was writing production code, then probably this would be something that I would I would do more. The fourth tip uh, he says is vectorizing your code, and that's at least for me the kind of thing that I've heard over and over again throughout my my time learning programming. I have to say that until recently, I didn't really know what that meant. I mean, I knew sort of conceptually what was going on, but I didn't know why doing things as a vector was so much faster than than iterating through it. Uh, so if you're like me and you're wondering about that, I recommend this article here from Noam Ross uh, that I thought explained it really nicely. Um, and, and basically what, what he says is it comes down to how many times you, you send the function how many times you go down to the C to do the to to do the calculation versus just staying there? So, you know, these functions like row sums, for example, will take the vector, take the whole thing, go to C, do the calculations a whole bunch of times, and then come back out of C. Whereas a loop, you have to go to C, do it once, come back, go to C a second time, come back. At least that's my my sort of naive understanding of how, of why vectorizing is so much faster. Uh, he has some tips again. These same functions he mentioned earlier in the chapter that I mentioned on a previous slide. Uh, and he has this sort of throwaway comment here, being be aware of vectorized functions like cumulative sum and difference. And as far as I can tell, that's all he says. <laughs> and I don't know what, what danger we should be aware of with those, um, why he says that. Does anybody else know these functions and know why? My impression was that he was saying like uh, like be aware of when you can use them like they're advantageous to use instead of like oh uh, yeah Maybe that's, like, that makes more sense doesn't it yeah 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 okay that, that's probably an example of something that's clear to everybody but not me <laughs> so um, and then the last sort of major tip is to avoid copying and. Uh, he mentions these, if you see these functions here in your code, that probably means that you're doing a lot of copying and there's a warning sign that you could be trimming it down. He has this example where uh, he's doing a whole bunch of pasting in a row. He's doing it either 10 times or 100 times, but doing it two different ways. Uh, one is through this collapse function where he iterates through a vector and paste one at a time onto the output or the other which uses the paste function which i guess is a vectorized alternative uh, and then compares the speed and as you can see it's, it's quite a bit fast <coughs> excuse me faster with the vectorized version um, but what he also sees in this example is that with uh the the the, the increase is not linear so for the vectorized version, going from 10 to 100 is about a six-fold increase in, in time. Uh, going from doing it in the non-vectorized version is more like a 20 or 30-fold increase in time. So that's a good thing to know about, that, that you know, these things aren't always linear and, and sometimes uh, it can be worth testing them at, at different with different sized inputs and, and, and seeing what comes out of it. So then the last bit of the chapter is this case study on the t-test. And here he sort of goes through how you might take a, a function and, and get it going as fast as possible. So I thought it'd be useful just to sort of run through it quickly. Uh, not all the steps that he mentioned earlier in chapter does he touch on here, but a few of them he does. And so just to give you an overview of what we're doing, he has a matrix, an M by N matrix. So it's a thousand rows long and 50 columns. And then he's got a group variable, which is either a one or a two. And, and so he's going to apply that to the columns of this matrix. So half the columns will be group one and half the columns will be group two. And he's going to do T tests between those two groups and see if there's a difference. And we're not gonna actually look at the results of the t-test, but that's the function that, that's happening here. And you mentioned that there's two different ways that you can call t-test, at least two different ways. One is a formula interface, which is this here, and then extracting out the t-statistic. 
the other is a pairwise um, t-test. So you, you give it the two things you're comparing. Uh, and it turns out that the second way is quite a bit faster. Uh, in this example, about fourfold faster. Here he's using system time rather than, than the benchmark. So, okay, uh, we'll start with, with this ladder scheme. Um, but the problem with this is that we're not saving any of the results. And so he, he adds to that uh, a mapping function to capture everything into this variable T1. So now you're going to have a, a thousand T statistics, uh, one for every, every row of that matrix. Um, so it's the same, the same function here, but just capturing it in this variable and, and measuring a system time there. And it's about the same as, as what you saw in the previous section. So now he, he touches on that third point, which is to do less work. And he says that this, this function, t-test, uh, calculates a lot of things, not just the t-statistic, but, but he doesn't care about any of those things. He just cares about the one thing. So what he's going to do instead is crack open that function and recreate it on his own, in his own with his own function. So, so that's wrapped up in a larger function. Here's the t-stat function he's written. You get the mean the length and the variance, uh, and you return a list of those things for um, each group, or for each row, I should say. Uh, or no, so for one group at a time, and then, then you, you put those into the two groups. So group one is, is group one, and group two is group two, and then you calculate the standard error across the whole thing with this function here, and, and then calculate the t-statistic. And so that is then mapped out to the variable T2. So the previous one was T1, this one is T2, and he says it's always good to check to make sure that the two things are the same. Um, so in this case, they are. And, and what he finds here is that now it's sped up quite a bit. So I think it was around, uh, what, 0.143, I guess that's seconds, milliseconds. I'm not sure what unit that is actually on system time. Um, but here it's about threefold faster. Um, so he's already improved the, the runtime by quite a bit. And then he goes into an example of this of vectorizing it. And this was, uh, to me, was the most insightful and the most useful. Um, the main idea of the function is the same, but now instead of giving it a, a, a vector of, of values, you're going to give it the entire matrix and you're gonna calculate the t-statistic on the thing as a whole um, using matrix multiplication or matrix operations. And so, and so you, this function to assign to t3 is, is now much more simplified and the runtime has gone down um, again by quite a bit. So it was 0 0.053 here, 0 0.014. So compared to where he started, uh, which was, Point 0.6, let's say, for example, uh, he's really gained quite a bit. And yeah, that, that's the end of the chapter. There's, like I said, there's a number of exercises that were useful. Um, I didn't include them here, but some of them, at, you have to basically go into the source code and dig around to figure out why different functions go different speeds. And I thought that was really useful. I didn't do it myself. Um, but I did look at the, the answer book <laughs> online and, and I thought it was really interesting to see how they approached the problem. Um, and just as a, as a side note, I've added some references that he mentions um, throughout the chapter here. Um, and this one I thought was really, was really interesting, the R Inferno. I'd never read this or heard of it, um, but if, if you're a, a Dante, fan you might like this it talks about the nine circles of our hell and and what the people who reside in each of those levels have done to merit their their fate um and it's he, he even cites dante <laughs> in the beginning and, and has written the, the introduction very much like the introduction to dante's inferno which is you know walking through the woods with virgil and seeing the gates and all this business um, as he's going into his R console. It's, it's, it's a clever book, so I, I recommend it. Um, and that, that's what I got. Cool. Um, he, he didn't go into like parallel, 
monopolization, right? Like, uh, I guess that, that seems like really applicable with like bigger data nowadays. I think all this stuff is really good for, I guess like regular size data sets, but like parallelization is kind of like a big thing. I, I mean, I guess it doesn't cover here and I guess it's really a package thing. If you use the right packages, it's all automated for you. But uh, that's a big part of, I think about speeding up our code nowadays. Is that a pretty new thing to be able to paralyze a multi-thread in R? I feel like two years ago that wasn't that didn't exist, or five years ago it didn't exist. I think it's existed, but like I think now there's a lot of packages for it, right? Like Tan pointed out for which you can now just basically plug and replace any per functions with fur. Uh, and and then there's also like the future package and other things um, that make it easy to, you know, run uh, things on multiple processes, processors. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm hesitant to ask, but I, I guess I'll do it anyway. Are, are any of you guys Python users? And can you attest to whether it, it is true that Python actually inherently runs faster? Or is that a myth? Or is it, you know, just derived from people who not, don't know how to optimize code the best. I'm not much of a Python coder myself. Does anyone have any input on that? Uh, I mean, I don't use it a lot, but from my experience, it is a little bit faster. I mean, just from doing like data frame type of operations. Uh, but I don't know, if you're like just doing exploratory data analysis with a, you know, a data set that can fit in your own RAM, I don't see why not use R. I mean, uh, but yeah, I think maybe at a, a you know regular data frame stuff, it's probably faster than tidyverse stuff. But I, I think I, I use data, data table too, and it seems data table is probably equivalent in speed. I mean, I've never done a comprehensive like test, but uh, that would be my experience and feeling. Mm. There are things like base R is not necessarily that fast, right? Like base R is written at a different, like the different like languages, like especially like tidyverse and stuff, as they get more, like, you know, more advanced, they wrap more C code. So, you know, string R used to be pretty slow or comparable to G rep, but now that it uses stringy, um, it's gotten faster, right? So it's now faster than base R's. Um, and like anything that wraps base R, and only base R is going to be slower than base R, just because it has to think to translate it into base R. But if you take like string R and then you, you know, because it now wraps stringy, which is a C language kind of thing, it's faster than base R. So like it's, you know, is it still R if it's just a C wrapper? You know, like those are all, those are, that's another question as well. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that, like, I don't know it's really comparable. Yeah, that's probably the best answer. It's hard to compare them or do like a comprehensive comparison. Um, I'm looking at this thing that might put, uh, maybe for modeling, you can kind of do it, but I mean, even then it's like different packages. Mm, yeah. I don't know if there's a, one, a single answer to that question. Yeah, I don't know either. There's R code that is explicitly slow. So things like for loops and like doing it wrong and the copy and modify behavior and all that stuff make it slow. But that doesn't mean that R in itself is slow. It's sort of like and there's just so many ways to look at it that like it's yes. almost impossible. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, you know, functionally speaking, and then like you know, which language do you think faster, and how much does your thinking time count against the programming time? It's just sure. another, it's just so many considerations. Yeah, I mean, I'm the only R user in a <laughs> company of Python enthusiasts, and, and I, I swear to God, I can get through a data frame and understand it much quicker than any of them, but that's me. That's not anything inherent about the software, I think. Yes. Has anyone used ProfViz before? Because I think I've actually, probably like a year you know it was like two years ago i did try to like use it for like an entire day i had like a 
project I was working on. And I think it, maybe it's like most useful when you get handed over a project or it's something you haven't looked at in a while and you're just like, why is this slow? But I feel like if you developed it, all the code, you probably already know why it's slow. I, don't, I mean, I guess there's- I've used it for shiny apps when there's like a ton of reactivity to try to see what is causing the slowness, but like I always forget that the x-axis is such a small increment of time, so what looks mm. slow isn't really slow. Yeah, I've done the same thing. It's more just like realizing like you, for example, things like you're passing in a 50,000 like length of like character vector into a like shiny picker, for example. When you do that, you're actually sending in like an API request to like a bootstrap library that's not even loaded on your computer. So like, it's like sending it through an API and back. So sometimes like when you like things you do, it's like identifying things you didn't know that were slow. That's what it's good for. It's not like something I do every day, but like when I, when I want to see what is the biggest root cause, Profis is really good for that. Um, where like you're trying to minimize like those kinds of problems or recognizing like that's a source of the problem and picking a different package or whatever, right? Um, whether I do it every day, like, you know, how often do I comp get complaints that my apps are slow? Well, you know, it's still faster than the Excel sheet that they were using before, so, yeah. Yeah. And I'm just trying to think of like times where I've like seriously done um, benchmarking or you know profiling. Uh, it's not too often. Like I usually just will. I mean, because I don't do really shiny stuff, and it, I guess just doing uh, functional programming, you can. I don't know. It's more intuitive, like to figure out. Oh yeah, I should use a vectorized function for this, or. You know, I'm loading all this data here. It's it's usually not the code itself. Um, it's usually something else, like yeah, the way you have the data structured, or well, maybe it isn't code. You can just change out uh, like a loop for uh, a vectorized function. But um, for me, I don't typically use benchmark unless it's like, I mean, yeah, unless it's for some pedagogical thing like this. Uh, it's more of like, like knowing the code and like, okay, yeah, and understanding the data structure and why that would be slow just from a theoretical perspective and then trying to refactor before you ever have, you know, like some slow code. Yeah, I know like, so I'm, I, I mentor in a boot camp and, and I think the data structure issue is probably one of the most common things that people who are new to the field don't appreciate how important it is to, to have that in place in advance and how much overhead you save by just being aware of what the sensible data structure is before they start. Yeah. 